Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let's pray. Let's start. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for another opportunity to get together and learn. Open our hearts, open our minds, give us understanding. And uh, we pray that you will strengthen each of us uh, in our journey, in our pre preparation uh, to serve you and to serve people. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, today, one more class, a little difficult, a little audio. Sorry. Oh. What's going from there? Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. So, welcome everyone. Slight change to the audio settings. Um, so today, uh, at least for the first part, we will uh, we have a little kind of a science-related topic. So, um, just bear with me. We'll go through it, and then we will get into you know, some uh, other things that may be of more interest. But today we want to uh, initially talk about the Big Bang Theory. And let's um, try to explain it in very simple terms. So this is lesson number seven, right? Page 36. So just for us to understand it, and if, there's a lot of information out there. People write lots of books and, you know, back and forth. Uh, but in a sense, it's an attempt to explain the origin of the universe. How did everything start? According to God's word, we are saying in the Genesis 1 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created everything. So, this vast expanse of this universe, billions of stars, everything God created. In the beginning, but um, scientists um, try to. I'm not saying all scientists, but some have attempted to come up with another theory of how everything started. It's called the Big Bang theory. Right? So our goal is just to understand a little bit about this, and I'm not saying we're going to go study this in detail. Even I don't know everything about this in detail, but understand basic. What is the idea? What are they saying? And uh, scientifically, what are some of the gaps, right? Just to know that there are gaps, even in this theory. So what is its theory? That the theory is about 14 billion years ago, many, many, many years ago, even much more than what we can imagine, 14 billion, 10 to the power of 9, 14 billion years ago, in a very small little uh, it's called a moment or a singularity where mass, energy, space, it all existed. Mass, energy, space, and like a very small together, highly compressed, a lot of energy, all compressed. And in a moment, all of that was released. So that's what it's a big bang. All that was released. And a, and as the you know everything was being thrown up, thrown apart or forced apart, subatomic particle particles came into existence. From there, atomic atoms came into existence. From there, molecules. From molecules, more complex compounds, you know, and matter, and like that over many, many, many years. Slowly, things happened, and then. Things happen on, on the earth from all of these mo molecules, eventually life came. So it's some sort of a theory how this was hap would have happened. And in order for to accommodate that theory, uh, it must have happened, they say, over billions of years. So there are some basic questions, you know, just logical questions. First would be a starting point problem. Okay, you're saying. At some point in the way beyond, 
in the past. There was matter, energy, so much together held in a small point of singularity. Where even, okay, but you're assuming there was so much of energy, so much of energy. You're assuming there's so much of mass. Where was, where did that come from? Even if you're making that assumption. So we call it a starting point problem. So even if you make that assumption, where did all that come from? What was the source of that energy? You know, uh, uh, where, where, this, where did this come? So the starting point. And then the other second problem is, which we have already spoken of many times in the past, is like a design problem. Okay, you're saying everything happened in some, there was a big explosion. An explosion is not something in order, it's chaos, it's random. And out of that whole explosion, a random chaotic explosion, we are saying this huge universe came into existence where today we are seeing so much of order. Everything is in proper order. Every day, sun is coming up, the earth is rotating, it's revolving, all these things and so much order. And you're saying out of that big explosion, all this came. How could uh, such design and precision come out of a random explosion? And we call that a design problem. Right? So just some basic questions. Starting point problem, a design problem. But then, of course, there are many scientific questions people ask. So yeah, people get into this theory who study all the details. They can ask lots of questions. Right? Uh, we are not getting into all of that. But I just want you to know that there are these questions. And we've just given a small list. For example, uh, the theory claims that there would be the existence of a certain kind of particle uh, called monopole. That means it only has one uh, uh, one pole, like north or south, you know, positive, negative, one pole. But the theory assumes that that th those particles should have come into existence, but those particles have never been found. So if the Big Bang actually happened, you're saying monopoles would have been created. Uh, those should be in existence somewhere, but we have not been able to find them anywhere. Those kinds of particles. Okay. So that is like, okay, uh, that's an assumption. We don't find it. So practically, we are not seeing it. Second, similar to that, um, the, the Big Bang model or the theory suggests that there should be particles called like antimatter. Uh, should have been created when this whole explosion happened. Again, um, equal amounts of matter and antimatter should exist. We find matter, but we don't find antimatter, or very negligible, very. So again, that becomes a question. If you're saying this, this theory is supposed to be accepted, and if this is what actually happened, and your theory itself is saying, Equal amounts of matter and antimatter are supposed to have been produced. We don't see it. Again, a third example would be um, population three stars. That means these are stars that were formed out of very light elements. So in the very beginning, as the universe was expanding and atoms were being formed, there were these very light ele uh, elements that could have formed the earliest stars. And those stars should still, te technically, those stars should still be in existence, not like disappear. They should, should be there. But we don't find any of those. We don't find those kind of stars formed out of these light elements of hydrogen, helium, and lithium. We don't find them. We only find stars with uh, heavy elements. So then the question, OK, if those stars were formed first, and they should still be in existence, where are they? You don't find them. So again, another. So many things that the theory proposes should have happened. We don't see any evidence of those things actually happening. Right? And one last thing is when we, when we look at certain points across uh, in, the, uh, in the universe, uh, we refer to it as uh, 
cosmic microwave background radiation. So CMB, cosmic microwave background radiation. Sorry, I didn't put that expansion here. Um, that there are points in the universe that are um, of equal temperature, like extreme points. So if you imagine a, 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 a funnel or a yeah funnel, there are extreme points in the universe uh, that are of equal temperature. Then we say, well, how is it possible? How did these points come into thermal equilibrium? How did they come into? And so one scientist suggested, uh, he came up with another theory called cosmic inflation. That means they were the whole universe was together at a particular point and you know, at a very fraction of a second, 10 to the minus 34 second, they were all together. And so they came into equilibrium before they expanded. So when the universe expanded, everything, you know was in thermal equilibrium. But again, there's only a theory. There's no way to prove that this actually happened. Right? So the point is, uh, there are many pieces of this theory, which as a scientist, right, as scientists, when they look into it, now we are not scientists, we are not studying these things, but I'm just giving examples, that when scientists study this theory and say, okay, if the theory is trying to explain how everything happened, there are many steps along this theory where there is no evidence for what they are saying should have happened, like the formation of monopoles or antimatter or, uh, uh, you know, stars formed with the light elements, you know, or um, uh, cosmic inflation these things, then there's no proof or there's no evidence that it actually happened. So therefore, the, uh, the theory itself is questionable. Right? Now, of course, uh, over time, they will refine the theory. They'll, you know, they'll change it. Uh, they'll say, okay, it didn't happen like that. It happened like this. And that's information you, know, you keep reading in the news. Uh, oh, we discovered this now. Therefore, maybe that didn't happen. That, that theory is wrong. So let's adjust the modify the theory. Therefore, like this. So the theory keeps getting revised, keeps getting modified based on new things that they see and so on. Uh, but the point is, in this theory itself, there are lots of unanswered questions. Okay. So uh, I just want you to be aware of it. I'm not saying this is something you have to memorize or. Uh, you can always point them to the right direction. Say, hey, you go look into this theory. Uh, we can give you references where uh, scientists, people who are studying this, can point out the flaws in the theory of in the Big Bang theory. Right? We ourselves are not scientists. We're not studying into all of this. Right? Lesson number eight, uh, just an addendum to the previous two uh, chapters, which one was on evolution and the other one was on Big Bang. So in connection with it, um, you know, some some thoughts. And I've just given you links or references that you could go look up if you're interested in reading more. Uh, so how old is, is the Earth? So scientists say, again, those who study this, they say, OK, it's about 4 billion years old. 4 billion. According to the Bible, maybe 6,000 years, around that. right? approximately 6,000 years old. They are saying 4 billion. And they, of course, they use carbon dating and other, other uh, radiometric, you know, radiometric uh, decay uh, techniques to estimate the age of the Earth. So they have the techniques. And say, look, we are measuring and we are telling you 4 billion years. Two questions, that, I mean, two things are we respond. One is, OK. Um, we understand the measuring technique, but how sure are we about the technique itself? Is it accurate? Is it reliable? Second, what we are saying, that God created everything in a mature state. What you are saying took 4 billion years old, I mean 4 billion years to come together. What we are saying is God put it together in an instant. So you measure, you measure 4 billion, you can measure 10 billion, you can measure any billion. When God created time, energy, power, and design, 
was compressed in a moment. God did it. So, we are not concerned if you say it's 1 billion, 2 billion or 4 billion. It doesn't matter. God put it all together in an instant. Now we measure and we say, okay, this, looking back, should have taken so many billions of years to happen. God put it together in a moment. So for us, our response is that. Similarly, what about fossils? Uh, like we, we said earlier, and I, you know, again, uh, people are studying this. We are not you know, studying all the details or everything, but you can see uh, information where looking at fossils, two things. One is there are many gaps, many gaps. It's not like you know, you, we have exactly every step of the way there is a fossil to prove that this has happened. No, no, no. There are many gaps. And uh, secondly, even in estimating the life of the fossils, there are human errors. And it's repeated. You know, so somebody would say, oh, this fossil must have been from so and so thousand of years. It's only they say, no, 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 actually, we made a mistake. It only is coming out a few hundred years. Change. But that information generally is just covered up because it's a very embarrassing thing. But the people who are studying it will highlight those things. Say, hey, look, we've repeatedly made such mistakes. You know, when we estimate the age of fossils. Um, so you can look up information on that. I've just given you some links. And, and lastly, People say, hey, look at all the dinosaurs that we are finding. You know, we are finding all these skeletons. And every now and then you'll find in the news, oh, they found the fossil of some dinosaur. That should have been in so many thousands of years ago, must have been there. Uh, but what is not disclosed is that many of these dinosaur bones have actually not been fossilized. It's not as old as they claim it to be. You know, but they would want to state something because they want to fill in the gaps. So they will say, okay, this we know there's a gap here, so let's put this in that gap. But the reality is it's not as not even fossilized. There are e even soft tissue proteins in DNA. And technically, this should not have lasted more than a few hundred years old, a few hundred years, if the soft tissue was to be found. So, or if the DNA was to, you know, have uh, still been in existence, these things don't last like for oh, millions of years. So, those are things that uh, we can question. And now they'll say, hey, how come dinosaurs are not mentioned in the Bible? Then we say, okay, look at it very logically. Uh, the Bible was translated into English around, you know, 1611. The word dinosaur was only formed in 1841. It came later. So even when you are translating the Bible, the word dinosaur was not there. So they, they, when they translate the Bible, they called it dragon, they called it behemoth, some big animal. They didn't call it dinosaur. We don't know. Secondly, uh, the Bible is not an encyclopedia. It doesn't have English to all the animals, birds, uh, creatures. not an encyclopedia. Just that God created animals, and what were some animals that people saw in those days, they wrote it down. And they didn't have the same knowledge and terminology as we have today in classifying animals. That's okay, something big, some huge animal. You know, so we find descriptions, a mention of such kinds of things. Uh, we can't necessarily say it was a dinosaur or a hippopotamus or whatever it is. could be something big animal that they saw. But that does not rule out the existence of these dinosaurs within the last 6,000 years. It doesn't rule it out. It just existed. Right? So, uh, just for us to know that all this information is available and we, don't, we are not intimidated by these findings. You know, that we can answer, especially the people who are studying these things, from a biblical standpoint, we can still respond to these things. All right. So with that, we kind of conclude the first part of our journey, which is having to deal with the existence of God, 
creation versus evolution, Big Bang, all of that. Okay. And uh, yeah, and just to know that, look, you, there are places you can go to get answers on these things. Uh, any questions before we change our our thought? Go ahead. Do we have extra mic? No, we don't. We oh, we have. Yeah. Let me see any questions online also. Yes, go ahead, please. So uh, when we are speaking about God created uh, this creation in instant mode. So we know that there are thousand types of thousand uh, types of trees, plants, and all. Mm. Does God have before only the blueprint of uh, you know trees should have earth should have the trees and the oceans? These all does God have before only blueprint when He told instant they only created. Um, okay. Did does okay? So I'm trying to answer the question. Did God have a blueprint? Of all the kinds of plants, plants and, and all the kinds of creatures that are going to that you know yeah. that keep happening, because even now we, we find new kinds of plants and new kinds of creatures. And so, did God have a blueprint? That's a very interesting question. Now, here's what I'm thinking, and I'm I'm kind of, of course, we can't give direct chapter and verse, but here's how I'm trying to think about this. One, the Bible says, yeah, this is Psalm 145, I think. It says, God calls all the stars by name. He knows all the stars by name. So the stars means, like, you know, we think of that. We ourselves don't know how many stars. We said, like, okay, there are billions of stars in this universe. We don't know because we haven't seen the full expanse. It's like countless, we say, countless stars. See, but He knows everything by name. Secondly, we think about the human race, we think about ourselves. We also have, we're all a mix of different kinds of people. Yeah. And especially in this world today, uh, many races are intermingling and uh, uh, all kinds of people are, you know, being formed. And the Bible is very clear that God knows each one of us. He knows each one of us. He knew us from the beginning. So if you think about human, uh, we have about eight, yeah, about eight billion people on the earth right now. And God knows every person. He knows each one by name. The very hair on our head is all numbered so much. Then we think, oh, God knows every person. And he knew us even before the foundation of the world. He didn't say, oh, you came. Who are you? <laughs> what is your name? <laughs> no, no. He knew us. I'm just trying to think through on your question. So if God knows all the stars by name, if God knows all of us by name, and we people also, all kinds of people are being born, you know, and, but he knew us even from the beginning. That means his mind is so great, so infinite. So therefore, I am inclined to think that God already knows all the kinds of plants and all the kinds of creatures, animals that may come into existence, are yet to come. Like, you know, nowadays we cross pollinate this and that and different kinds of flowers and trees, all, all kinds of things are happening. It's, I don't think it's a surprise to God. Uh, I'm thinking, based on what we look at it, God already foreknew, or phone, He knows in advance all this. It's not a surprise. Uh, it's not something new that God didn't know. So that would be my answer, I, that God already knows this. He's, so inf he's infinite in His knowledge. <clears throat> Uh, he knows what kind, even in the vegetation or creatures or animals, he knows what kind of things are going to be born. So much so that Jesus says, you see the grass of the field, you see the lily in the, in the, in the field, not one of them falls to the ground 
without your heavenly father's knowledge that means he knows everything that's my yeah just my deduction <laughs> good any other questions yes please king james only greek and hebrew so prior to so origin so let's say like everything was in hebrew aramic hebrew and portions of the old testament were in aramic then we had the greek translations of the hebrew uh, so that was called the septuagint so they translated the hebrew into greek then we had the new testament written in greek then i think the earliest was uh, the latin translation so they had latin translation and uh, i i think before the english there were a couple of other languages translated of the bible uh, and i don't i forget the sequence we're going to go to some of it but um, let's say up until the 1400s uh, till the till martin luther came along and all of that the reformation was primarily latin uh, which the people in that in europe were reading at that point but there were other translations at least portions of it other I would say like European languages before the English came along later uh, into uh, I think before King James there was um, uh, there were there were others who did translate I think it was um, I forget the names now and again it's in our book on uh, revivals visitations right uh, when we trace the history um, there was uh, Wycliffe and there was also uh, who else did the Bible translation? I'm not getting the name. So before we reach King James, there were others who did translate into English. Yeah, people who did not know Latin, Hebrew, Aramaic, and thing, they had something to read or later on. Later on, we come. I, I would say around the 1500s, like a, a little after Martin Luther, around that time, uh, we had. Uh, others who translated like um so like we cliff and there's uh, somebody else i forget the name who translated into english uh and then uh came like the king james was a more formal thing but it was done by a group of people so that was what made it different before it was individuals who did the translation yeah but english came much later on So that was one of the reasons for the Reformation, because at the, till Martin Luther came along, Bible was available primarily in Latin. So the common people didn't have access to it. And so they didn't know what the Bible was actually saying, how to be saved, and so on. But Martin Luther kind of brought that out, saying we are saved by faith. You know, we are justified by faith. But again, all of that was still happening in Latin, maybe German, things like that. You know. English came a little later. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you have a question? Yes. Online students, you're welcome to ask questions. Pastor, what Bible tells about the shape of the earth? What the Bible says about the shape of the earth. Good question. I never really studied it. <laughs> What's the Bible saying about the shape of the earth? Um, I'm thinking about passages like Genesis 1, Psalm 8, Psalm 19, where it's talking about the heavens, it's talking about, yeah, uh, about the stars and all that. But I don't think say like I don't think anywhere the Bible says the earth is round it doesn't state it it says things like the foundations of the earth and so on so it gives the impression as though the earth is flat because foundations mean you know but again that's that is poetic language it's not literal um so I, at least from what I'm thinking right now, 
to my understanding, there is no place in Scripture where it, we can say clearly, oh, look, the Bible is saying here, earth is round. And this probably is one reason why the understanding of the earth, so initially, people thought earth was flat. And later on, when people started saying the earth is around, uh, they actually did receive some opposition from the church. Because they thought, if you're saying the earth is round, you're contradicting scripture. It's not like the Bible is saying earth is round. It's just that we didn't know better. Yeah, And they assumed that, okay, earth was flat. So to answer your question, uh, the Bible doesn't tell us the earth is round. Um, neither does it state the earth is flat. See, it's not, it's not stated either way. Right? It does use other language, like, okay, God measures the heavens with the span, uh, the sun rises up, you know, uh, the, uh, the heavens uh, utter speech, night unto night, day unto day, there's no place where the voice is not heard, uh, or talks about the foundations of the earth, things like that. But that doesn't necessarily mean the earth is Bible is saying earth is flat. It's not saying that. It's just using different language. In Isaiah forty one twenty two. Hmm. Isaiah forty verse twenty two. Let's turn there. Yes, go ahead. It it is he who sits above the circle of the earth, mm. and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, mm. and spread them out like a tent to dwell in. Yes. So it's like, yeah. I mean, um, I am not hundred percent sure what he mean, means by the circle of the earth. Uh, but it seems to give the impression that God is covering the earth, therefore the earth must be round or something. Now, Isaiah 40. Uh, yeah. Can we use this to um, state, or, you know, because if we say, like, okay, this could be poetic language, like God is fully covering the earth. Um, or can we use this to say that the Bible is saying, oh, this is round? Um, I'm not too sure. Um, because it talks about the heavens like a curtain, which would be linear. Um, spreads out the heaven, 10 to 12. Yeah. Um, he sits above the circle of the earth. Proverbs 8.27. Yeah, when he prepared the... Proverbs 8.27, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, he drew a circle on the face of the waters. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Maybe he it's referring to he drew a boundary of the waters or something. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we can definitely point to these scriptures, but at the same time, to keep in mind that this could be poetic language. I mean, it's like not literal. You know, it's language that's used to describe some something. Um, because we don't want to try to make, try and say, hey, the Bible is a very scientific book, because then there'll be a lot of other things they can point out. So we have to stay careful that, look, there is poetic language in the Bible. Some of it yeah, seems to indicate it's saying, like, Earth is round or there's a circle and all that. But then people can point us to other things, like, hey, you're saying Earth has foundations. Where, what foundation is talking about? You know, or things like that. Then that's when, when we say it's poetic language, then you say, why, why are you not saying it's poetic here? So I think we just say, look, um, these are, we can point to these scriptures, but we don't need to make the Bible a scientific book. That's okay. Yeah.
Master, what's your take uh, when we are usually happy or we are sad or sometimes even when we are we are having a praise and worship, the tendency is to look upwards to the sky. So what's your take on it? Why uh, most of well, us always look up to the sky and like in... Why do we look re- up? Yeah, are we like referring to the heaven above or how is it? And why is it that we are... We, we, we usually do that. When we are really happy, we will look up to the God. Yeah. Why do we look up to the sky? I think it's just, you know, for us trying to say that somebody beyond our realm, so you're looking up, God is there. You know, somebody beyond our realm, it's God who is, you know, whether you'll be worshipping or God is doing good things in our lives, things like that. Yeah, but I don't think necessarily any. Yeah, something very deeply spiritual. <laughs> sure. So about star's name, I want to ask, like, how people got to know a star's name? Like God already knows, but scientific, uh, the scientists discovered, like, Stevenson, U. Y. Scuti, how they got to know? Yeah, so it's, it's names that we give. Uh, and sometimes it's based on uh, even the person who found it, who look at it, they'll put their name on the star, things like that. So I think it's, um, yeah, I, I I think in some cases, the people who discovered it, sometimes it could be given in which part of the the universe they discovered it. So I, I don't know exactly the way they give and assign names, uh, but it's what we ascribe to this. It's not like these are the names that God gave. It's names that we gave, yeah, humans gave to the stars and the constellations and so on. Master, I have a question. Yes, please, go ahead. Master, the oldest language on Earth is Tamil, right? Oh, I don't know. They say the oldest language is Tamil. I just want to know how did it originate? Did uh, Adam and Eve speak uh, Tamil? First... I am not sure if Tamil is the oldest language. I'm not sure. I I, I don't know. Um, I don't know which is the oldest language. Uh, but I have a feeling it's not Tamil. But maybe even Sanskrit is older than Tamil. Um, and then I don't, there could be languages older than Sanskrit. Um, so, okay. So I don't. I, I mean, off I, I we cannot definitely Google it, but. Um, I, I don't know which is the oldest language. Um, so the the underlying question is, how did language come into existence? Uh, I think definitely, you know, it's something that, and I'm trying to imagine now, and I'm sure there there, there probably be some course, you know, in, in the whole area of linguistics, how a language originated. And I've not, I've not done any of it, neither have I read it. But I'm just trying to imagine that uh, people would have evolved a form of communication. So even today, uh, we assemble or we put together letters and so on, uh, you know, even, and then we use it to communicate. So I'm just trying to think back in time uh, there would have been, and when we look at some, you know, really ancient things that people find, they used characters, they used meanings, you know, different things they drew in order to communicate. Um, I, I don't, I, I'm not an expert in this. I haven't studied it. So, you know, I'm just imagining that God would have given people the intelligence over time to put these things together and use it as forms of communication. But I'm sure that, you know, we can research this, look it up online, uh, find uh, in the area of linguistics, people would have studied how languages came together and spread over time. Yeah. Pastor, when we pray in tongues, we we pray in uh, different tongues, but could this be also the older languages spoken before? Yeah, because First Corinthians chapter thirteen says, "We pray in tongues of men and of angels." That means we speak when we pray in tongues. We could be praying in human languages or in 
the language that angels speak in. So, you know, that's, and of course, the language is given to us by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Uh, the Holy Spirit is inspiring the words. So, he knows all languages, earthly languages, human languages, as well as Heaven. heavenly, heavenly languages. So, at any point when he's inspiring the language through us, it could be any language, old or new, heavenly, I mean, earthly or heavenly. So we're just being open. And that's why, you know, Paul tells us in Romans 8, he says, like, we, we speak with, uh, sometimes we, we pray with groanings, which cannot even be uttered. You know, there, there's, there's these things that come out of us sometimes, which, uh, it, you know, in, in articulate speech, it means we speak things that it doesn't even sound like a language. So... Thank you, Pastor. Welcome. Warren, please go ahead. Yes, Pastor. I was just uh, I was having a talk with my uh, a close friend of mine who's uh, uh, also a pastor, basically. And we we're talking about the creation. We we're talking about the gap theory. And uh, he was saying, so I asked him a question about what his views were, you know. And he was saying, you know, the Hebrew term um, for day, yom, does not always refer to a day of 24 hours. For example, it is always used to describe the day of the Lord, Yom Kippur, or the day of the Lord's vengeance, referring to the wrath judgment on the nation on his, at his return. Interestingly, the day of the Lord's vengeance is mentioned right next to the year of the Lord's favor, which refers to the age of grace in Jesus, which we are still living in, a year of 2,000 solar years and counting. And uh, he goes on to say, there's also the fact that Jacob was asked to work an extra week for Rachel, when in reality it was seven years. Uh, Genesis 29, 28. There is also the prophecy of Daniel 9 that, that, that times the remaining time of God's redemption plan as 70 weeks, referring in reality to 70 times 7 years, so 490 years. And then lastly, Hebrews 4 talks about the rest of God as established on the seventh day and how some have not yet entered that rest because you can only enter that rest in Jesus. Namely, we are still in the seventh day of rest, which has lasted since the end of creation in Genesis 1 and 2. Hmm. Um, yeah, Warren. So I think, for example, you know, like we said, we can break this down. And thanks for bringing it up. Everything has to be taken in its context. Uh, when we take things out of context and try to put them all together, it definitely doesn't make sense, right? So the term day... Yes, it's the word yom. Uh, in its context, it means a 24-hour day. But we also understand the term day as used in, like you referred, day of the Lord, uh, is used for dispensations or broader periods of time, longer periods of time. Right? Um, so how do we resolve that? we have to always use it in the context. And one of the things that really locks in the context for us is what we saw earlier in Exodus 20, where God says, you know, the Lord worked six days, and the seventh day he rested. And God wants us to do the same thing. So that, that locks the context in for us. We do understand the term day is also used for longer periods of time, as in saying the day of the Lord, the day of his vengeance. But the context of day in Genesis 1 and 2 is locked in for us when God uses that again in Exodus 20. And he says, on the seventh day you rest. There, he says, six days you work, seventh day you rest, just as God himself did it in Genesis 1 and 2. So that clarifies everything. The context is put in place for us. The way day is used for Genesis 1 and 2 is uh, the same way we work in God work. Yes, I, we understand the same day is also used in other contexts, but we don't mix the contexts. Very clear. There's a differentiation in the context. So context determines the meaning, and the context is very clear for us. Similarly, um, the context of the term year, right? You, you, the year doesn't come into this picture here. Uh, we we understand the year could be used in different contexts. 
the year of the Lord's vengeance, uh, the year you know, or the year of jubilee, is referring to a particular time and a season. Okay, every fiftieth year, it's a year of jubilee, uh, or there's a year of vengeance. But we don't mix that with trying. We don't use that to interpret the six days. No, these are you. The, all these terms must be used or understood in their context. The same thing with Daniel's 70th week. Um, yes, we understand a week in that context represents seven years. Perfect. Why? Because we see how Genesis 29, uh, when Jacob had to serve Laban, the language they used in those days, they said they used a week to refer to seven, seven years. So it served me for seven a week, which he meant seven years. But there's a context. We don't use that everywhere else, saying a week always means uh, seven years. There is a context within that, yes. Or, for example, on the first day of the week, uh, where the, you know, in the New Testament, you'll find um, the, on the first day of the week, they all met to gather together for worship. Their week is seven days. We don't take what we read in Genesis 29 or the application of it in Daniel 7 and then apply it here. That will be taking out of the context. The same word week used, but it always has to be interpreted in its context. So if you put everything together, like how you said your friend mentioned, we will get a totally chaotic ex ex um, you know, uh, interpretation of scripture. So everything has to be held in context and the context, you know, which is we have to intelligently interpret scripture. So don't take the word week everywhere we find in the Bible and me make it to mean seven years. It will be absurd. We'll get absurd interpretations. So that would be my response to what your friend said, with all respect to him as a pastor, that, hey, everything held in context. If you take things out of context, we'll get really absurd interpretations. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yes. Pastor, Jesus when ascended to heaven, so he went up. So it means heaven is up, or he didn't went right or left like that. So where heaven will be and where the hell will be? Good question. See, if the earth is round, for somebody, heaven up is this way, and the other person, heaven is the other way. Imagine, like, you know, the earth is round. Depending on which part of the earth we are standing on, Earth is, heaven is in a different direction, right? So to answer your question, I mean, the Bible does use language like, you know, it's in the north, you know, north. But north, again, is different for everybody, uh, depending on where you're standing, right? So I think we shouldn't worry too much. God is there. He knows where heaven is. So where is heaven? It's where God is. Where is it exactly in terms of latitude? I mean, in terms of location in this universe? Let's not worry about it. You know, uh, uh, we'll find out. Um, so we don't know, right, exactly. Because for each one, when we look up, we're all looking up in different directions, literally, north, south, east, west. Yeah. So I think don't worry too much about it. All right. Um, yeah, Lucy, a question about different denominations in Christianity and so on. Um, we cover that in our course on Christian history. I know it's a second second year course, but I don't know which semester it is. I forget. You have now? Oh, okay. So it, you're having one co uh, a course on Christian history and missions, and in that course, as we go through the book on revivals, visitations, moves of God, we go through Christian history, and you'll see how these you know various denominations came about, uh, starting I mean with um, the Catholic Church and then the Reformation and so on. So uh, I'm sure you will, you know, get into the details on that. Is it okay? Oh, yes, Pastor. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So we'll pause here for today. Next next week, we'll start off on uh, the next lesson, which is basically how do the Bible come to us uh, when people question and ask us about the Bible? Is it something we can rely on and so on? Okay. So let's close for today. Thank you so much, everyone. God bless.